from Copenhagen, Denmark. It's the Cube covering KubeCon and CloudNativeCon Europe 2018. Brought to you by the Cloud Native Computing Foundation and its ecosystem partners. Okay, welcome back everyone. Live coverage here in the Cube in Europe at Copenhagen, Denmark for KubeCon. Europe 2018, this is theCUBE. We're supposed to have the CNC at the Cloud Native Compute Foundation, part of the Linux Foundation. I'm John Furrier, co-host of theCUBE with Lauren Cooney, the founder of Spark Labs, new venture around open source and innovation, our analyst here today with theCUBE. And our two guests are Michael Hausenblas, who's the direct developer advocate at Red Hat. Diane Muller is the director of community development at Red Hat. We're talking about OpenShift, Red Hat, uh, and just the, the uh, rise and success of OpenShift has been uh, really well documented here on theCUBE, but certainly in the industry, everyone's taking notice. Great to see you again, welcome to theCUBE, good to see you. Thank you. Wonderful to be here again. Um, so, first of all, a lot of big news going on. Core OS is now part of Red Hat, so that's exciting. I haven't had a chance to talk to you guys about that yet here in theCUBE, but you know, great, get great puzzle piece from the industry there for you guys, congratulations. Yeah, it's, it's been an, a, a wonderful um, collaboration. Uh, having the CoreOS team as part of the Red Hat and the OpenShift team, was, it's just a perfect fit. And the team from CoreOS, like, they've always been my favorite people. Right, and Brandon Phillips and the team um, over there are just awesome, and to have the expertise from Tectonix, the operator framework, which you'll hear more about here at um, KubeCon EU this week, uh, to have Quay under uh, the wings of um, Red Hat now, and you know, at Quay as a registry with OpenShift or with any other yep. Kubernetes thing is, you know, the stuff that they brought to the table and the expertise and as well as the wonderful culture that they had um, is just, it, it was such a perfect fit with OpenShift. And you know, you guys bring a lot to the table too and I was, I've been, I've been kind of critical of CoreOS in the past, in a good way, because I love those guys. I had good chats with them over the years, but they were so pure open source guys, like Red Hat. Well, there's and nothing wrong with being no, pure open no, source. No, <laughs> I'm, no, I'm cool with that, but you guys have perfected the business model. You have great customers, so one of the things that they were always strong at was the open source piece, but when you start to monetize and you start to get into the commercialization, it's hard for a startup to be both pure open source and to monetize. You guys now have it together. Yeah, great so fit. It's it's a wonderful thing. We at um, on the OpenShift side, we have the OpenShift Commons, which is our open source community, and we've sort of flipped the model of community development, and that's at, at Red Hat. Um, and one of the things is they've been really strong CoreOS um, with their open source projects, whether it's etcd or you know a, a whole myriad of other well, let's things. Let's let's double down on that. I want to get your thoughts. What is this Open's Common, OpenShift Commons? Take a minute to talk about what you guys had. You had an event Monday. It was word on the, on the streets here in the hallways is very positive. Take a minute to explain what right. happened, so what's going on with that So program. OpenShift Commons is the open source community around um, OpenShift origin, um, but it also includes all the upstream projects that we collaborate with, with um, everybody from the Kubernetes world, from the Prometheus, all the CNCF project leads, um, all kinds of people from the, the upstream projects that are part of um, uh, the OpenShift ecosystem, as well as all the service providers and partners who are doing wonderful things, and all the hosts like Google, and you know, just there's just Microsoft Azure folks are in there. But it's um, we've kind of flipped the model of community development on its head. In the past, if you were a community manager, which is what I started out as, is you were trying to get people to contribute to your own code base. And here, because um, there's so much cross-community collaboration going on, we've got people working on Kubernetes, we've got Kubernetes people making um, commits to origin, we've, we work on the OCI Foundation, trying to get the container stuff all figured so out. So you say flip the model, you mean there's now multiple project contributions there's, going on? Yeah, there's multi we're, we're, we've got our fingers in lots of okay. pies now, and we have to, uh, the collaboration has to be open, and there has to be a lot of communication. So the OpenShift Commons is really about creating those peer-to-peer -peer networks. Yep. Um, we do a lot of stuff virtual. I host my own um, OpenShift Commons briefings twice a week, and I could probably go to three or four days a week and do it, because there's so much information. There's a fire hose of new th stuff, yeah. new features, new releases, the stuff. Uh, Michael just did one on FAS. Um, you did one before um, yeah. for the machine learning SIG right. on OpenShift right. on well, Camelot. I want to I wanted just get your thoughts, Michael, on this, because yeah. what came up yesterday in theCUBE was integration, glue layers are really important, so I can see the connection here. Yep. Having this commons model allows people to kind of cross-pollinate, mm -hmm. one, two, 
talk about integration because we got Prometheus, I might use Kubeflow. So there's new things happening. What's what does this mean for the integration piece? Good good for it or accelerating it? What's your right, thoughts? Right, right, right. So I mainly work upstream, which means Kubernetes, Kubeflow, and other projects. And for me, these kind of uh, areas where you can bring together both the developers and the end users, which is super important for us to get the feedback to see where people really are struggling. And we hear a lot from those people that meet there uh, what their pain points are. And that is the best way to essentially shape the agenda to say, well, maybe let's prioritize this over this other feature. And as you mentioned, integration being one big part. And functions as service being, you know, could be considered as the visual basic of applications for cloud native computing. It, it can act as this kind of glue between different things there. And I'm super excited about Commons. That's, that's yeah. a, for me, a great place to actually meet these yeah. people. So the and Commons is them. almost a cross pollination yeah. of folks that are actually using the code, building the code, and they see other projects that makes sense to contribute to, yeah. and so it, it's it's an alignment it's where a, you allow for that cross-pollination. It's a huge series of conversations, and one of the things that um, is really important to all of the projects is, as, as Michael said, is getting that feedback from um, production deployments, mm -hmm. people who are working on stuff, so we have, a, a, we, I think we're at around 375, um, uh, organizational members, so there's... What percentage of end user organizations do you think? It's probably about 50-50. Uh, you know, you can go to commons.openshift.org and look at the participants list. There's, um, I'm behind a little bit in getting it, everybody in there, but... Um, so we, it's good, healthy yeah, dose of end users. It's a good, healthy dose of end users. There's some special interest groups. Our special interest groups are more around use cases, so they'll be, um, we just hosted a machine learning um, reception two nights ago. We had about 200 people in the room um, I'd say 50% of them were from the Kubeflow community and the other 50% were users uh, or people who are building frameworks for to run on OpenShift. Right. And so our goal, um, as always, is to make uh, OpenShift uh, the optimal, the best place to run your, exactly. in this case, machine learning workloads. And I or think that's super critical because one of the things that I've been following a little bit and you know, I have your blog entry in front of me, is uh, the operator framework and yeah. really what you're trying to do with that framework and how it's progressing and where it's going and really if you can talk a little bit about what you're doing there, I think that would be great for our viewers. So I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure you get um, Brandon Phillips here um, on your Kubeflow sometime this week because I don't want to steal the thunder from his uh, keynote well, tomorrow drop morning. Drop a couple hints. I, so <laughs> Share a little bit, come on. So, so the operator stuff um, that CoreOS, and they brought it to the table, so it's really um, their, their baby. They had done a lot of work to make sure that um, they had first class access at, to be able to inject things into Kubernetes itself and make it run, and they're going to do a better technical talk on it than I am, and make things run. And so that what they've done is they've opened it up and created an SDK for operators um, so other people can build more. And we, we think this is uh, a tipping point for Kubernetes. So, um, and I don't want, I really don't want to steal any thunder <laughs> here um, or get in over my head sure, is the Brandon other part of it too. I think Brandon is the right person Brandon, to talk we'll, about Brandon, we'll drag yeah. Brandon over I'm here. I'm super excited about it, but let's Yeah, let's talk, well let's talk about why you're super excited about it. Is there anything you can kind of tell us in terms of it, it what? It enables people to run any kind of workload in Kubernetes in a reliable, automated fashion. So you bring the experience that human operators have into software, so you automate that bit, which makes it, you know, even more uh, suitable to run you know, your enterprise application that so far might not, not be the, the best place That's to run. That's great. Yeah. And yeah, I'm also looking forward to so I yeah, I think it's, it's great here. hearing about that and you know, we talk a lot about how it's, it's great for users, it's great you know, operators, developers, how they're building things out and things along those lines. But one of the things that we are not hearing a ton about here and we want to hear more about is security. Right. Uh, Security is increasingly important. Right. You know, we're hearing bits and pieces, but nothing's really kind of coming together here. And I, what are your thoughts on that? So security. I, I was recently when I when I blogged about it, and, and people on Twitter said, "Well, is that really true that you know Kubernetes is secure by default?" It's like, well, all the pieces are there. You need to be aware of it. Yeah. Um, you need to know what you're doing. Uh, but it, it is there, right? It might not, all the defaults might not be as you, as you would expect it, but 
you can enable it and you can, and I think we, we did a lot of innovations there as well, um, be it you know, our back and, and uh, the security context and so on. And actually, Liz Rice and myself, we're working on a, a community security um, cookbook in, in, uh, for O'Reilly that will come out later this year. We're trying to document these best practices because it is early days and it's, it's quite a, a range of things from building container images in a secure way to access control and so on. Yeah. So there's a lot of stuff. What, what are some of the end user feedback sessions or feedback data that you're getting from these sessions? What are some of the things you guys are hearing? What's the patterns? What's the things that are boiling up to the top? Yeah, there's so many. I mean, this this conference is I is one of those ones where it's a cornucopia of talks and trying to. And I just wrote a little blog post called "The Hitchhiker's Guide to KubeCon." Um, it's on blog.openshift.com, and because you know, there there you could spend. Uh, all of your time here in a different track and never leave it, like a security one or an operations yeah, it's one. It's a lot of great content. The IS, I think the Istio stuff is probably the hottest thing um, I'm hearing people going to. There was a great um, deep dive training session hands-on on Monday here that got incredible feedback. IBM and um, Google did that one. We had a lot of uh, customer talks and hands-on training um, sessions on Monday. Here there are Pretty much, uh, there's a great talk coming up this afternoon on Kube controllers uh, that Magic yep, is Magic at. Yeah, so Magic that, I yeah. think that's at 11.45-ish. Um, there are you know, a lot of the stuff around service mesh um, and service brokers uh, is really kind of the hot thing that people are, are looking for to get implemented and we've got a lot of people from Red Hat working on that. There's Oh man, there's etcd updates, there's a bazillion yeah, it's things. It's exploding going. big time here, yeah. no doubt about well, it. Right? Number one thing that I'm seeing last couple of months uh, being on site with customers and, and also here is um, that given that Kubernetes is now the de facto standard of container orchestration, people are much more willing to go all in. You know, yeah. A lot of folks were on the fence for a couple of years, going yeah. like, ah, which one is going to make it? Now it's kind of like, yeah. this is a given. You can, you know, just as Linux is, is everywhere on yeah. servers, um, that's the same with Kubernetes, and people are now happy to really invest. They're like, okay, let's do it yeah, now. Well, we're hearing too, just, just stepping back and looking at the big picture is, we see the trend, we're kind of hearing it and connecting the dots is, the number of nodes is going to ex expand significantly. Yeah. I mean, CERN was on stage yesterday, and we heard there's, and still small, not a lot of huge, not, not a lot of large scale, so we think that the scale question is coming quickly. I, right. Well, I think it already came, all right. Um, the, in the machine learning reception that we had tonight, uh, one of the gentlemen, uh, Willem uh, Bookwalter from Microsoft and Diane Fetima from Red Hat, and a whole lot of people are talking about how do we get, because machine learning workloads have such huge work, you know, GPU yeah. and uh, Google has their TPU requirements to, to get to scale, to run these things, that people are already pushing the, the envelope yeah. on Kubernetes. Jeremy Eater from Red Hat has done some incredible performance management work, um, and there's on the CNCF blog, they've um, posted all of that. The, to get the optimal performance and to get the scale is now, I think, one of the next big things, and there's yeah. a lot of talks and here Istio, on that. And that's Istio's kind of big service mesh opportunity there, yeah. is to bring that to the next level. To the next level. I, you know, there's going to be a lot of um, things that people are going to experience trying to get the yeah. most out of their clusters, but also um, I, I think we're, we're still at the edge of, of that. I mean, someone, well, someone said a, something about getting to 2,500 um, nodes, and I'm like thinking, that's just the beginning, baby. Yeah, it's going to be more than yeah, a couple zeros. I got to ask you guys, I got to put you both on the spot here because this is what we do on theCUBE. You guys are great supporters of theCUBE, we appreciate that, but we've had many conversations over the years um, with OpenShift, going back to OpenStax, I don't know what year it was, maybe 2012, or I don't know, I forget what year it was. Now, the success of OpenShift was really interesting. You guys took this to a whole nother level. What's the reaction? Are you, as you look back now on where you were with OpenShift and where you are today, yeah. well, do you pinch yourself and saying, damn? Or what, what's, what's your view on what's your Red Hat made a big bet on Kubernetes three years ago, three and a half years ago, when people thought we were crazy. You know, they hadn't seen it, they didn't understand what Google was trying to open source, and some of the engineers inside of Red Hat, Clayton Coleman, Matt Hicks, a lot of great people saw what was coming, um, reached out, worked with Google, 
and the rest of us were like, well, what about Ruby and Rails and MongoDB and you know doing all this stuff? And like we've invested so much in gears and cartridges and stuff. And, and then once they explained it, and once Google um, really open sourced the whole thing, um, the, making that bet as a company and pivoting um, on that dime and making version 3.0 of OpenShift and yeah. OpenShift Origin um, at, as a Kubernetes-based yeah. uh, platform as a service and then switching over to being a container platform. Um, yeah. all, that was a huge thing. And if you had talked to me back then, um, three years ago, it was kind of like, is this the right way to go? Yeah. But then, you know, well, okay. I, it's, it's important history to document that point because I remember we talked about it and one of the things, you guys made a good bet and people were scratching their head at oh, the yeah. time, big time. But also, you got to give credit to the community because the leaders in the community recognized the importance of Kubernetes early on. And I, we've been in those conversations and said, hey, you know, this yeah. you can't screw this up. Yeah. Because it was an opportunity, people saw the vision yeah, so and saw it as a great opportunity. I think, I think as much as I like the, you know, the technical bits, you know, as an engineer, the API being written in Go and so on, I really think the community, that is what really made the it. difference. Yeah, right? absolutely if you compare does. it with others, they're yeah. also successful, but here with, with CNCF, all the projects, all the people coming yeah. together, and I, I, I love the community. I yeah. really it's a case uh, study of how to execute, in my opinion. You guys did a great job in your role, and the people didn't get in the way and try to mess it up. Um, great, smart people understood it, shepherded it through, well, let it, it grow. And it really is um, kudos to the, the Kubernetes community and the CNCF um, for uh, incubating all of this wonderful yeah. cross-community collaboration. They do a great job with their ambassadors program. Yeah. The Kubernetes um, community does amazing stuff around their SIGs and, and making yeah. sure that projects get correctly incubated. They've done a, uh, you know, they're not afraid to rejig yeah. the, the processes. They've just done a wonderful thing, you know, changing the way that new projects come into the Kubernetes. And they, and I think that willingness to learn, learn from mistakes, to evolve, um, is something that's really kind of unique to the whole um, new yeah. way of thinking about open source now, and that's yeah. the change that we've seen. And open, open source, open movements always have a defining moment. You know, the OSI model, you remember, that stack never got fully uh, standardized, but it stopped at a really important point, yep. TCP IP. IP became really important. It created the interoperability world, Cisco as we know, and others. This is that kind of moment where yeah. there's going to be a massive wealth creation, value creation yeah. opportunity because you have people getting behind something as yeah. a de facto standard, right. and then there's a lot of edge work around it that can be innovated on. I think to me, this is going to be one of those moments we look back yeah. on. And I think it's that willingness to adjust the processes, to work with the community, um, and as, you know that Kubernetes, the ethos that's around this project. Um, we've learned from a lot of yeah. other foundations' mistakes. Um, we, you know, yeah. not not that they're um, better or worse, but we've learned that you, you can see the way we're bringing in new projects and adding them on. We took a step back as a community um, yeah. and said, okay, this is we're getting too many too soon, too fast, yeah. um, and maybe you know this is not quite the right way to go. And rather than doing the big tent umbrella approach, we've actually started doing some really rethinking of our processes and um, the governing board and the yeah. TOC of the CNCF have done uh, an, an awesome job getting that done. When you got lightning in a bottle, you stop and you package it up and you run with it. So congratulations, Red Hat Summit next week will be there. Oh the yeah. Cube. <laughs> Looking forward to you know, go, going deep on this. Well the, the OpenShift Commons gathering is the day before um, Red Hat Summit. We've come completely sold out, so you know, sorry, there's a wait list. But, um, we've gone from being uh, our first one, I think we had 150 people come. There's over 700 people now coming to the gathering one and 25 customers with production deployments speaking. And this is the day before Red Hat Summit. And yeah. I, you know, I, I lost count of how many OpenShift stories are being told at Red Hat Summit. Yeah. It's going to be a, a, a crazy jet laggy week next yeah. week. So. Congratulations, <laughs> you guys got a spring in your step. Well done, open shift, uh, going to the next level. Certainly the industry with Kubernetes, uh, service meshes, Istio. A lot of great coverage here in the Cube. Here in Europe for KubeCon 2018 in Copenhagen, Denmark. I'm John Furrier, Lauren Cooney, the founder of Spark Labs. I'm with the Cube. We'll be back with more live coverage. Stay with us, day two here at KubeCon. We'll be right back. Oh.